This is such a treat. I, to see faces like all you guys after all these years, it's fun. Some of you I've seen more recently than others, of course, so it's just a real treat. I was going to take the time here together to walk you through some of the historic events, some of which you were here for, some of which you may not have been here for in your tenure. Uh, but along the way, this is a really small group, so if you have questions, please, please stop me at any time or you want to talk more about something specifically, that would be great. Uh, I will say, I think one of the common themes in this foundation and the portfolio has been, I guess we describe it as positive change, um, you know, constantly looking to do this better. Uh, and the portfolio has reflected that. And I think we've tried to be a good partner in terms of making ourselves better and stronger and providing better advice. And I'll show you a couple of, of examples of that in a moment, if that's okay. Um, so we thought we'd start with, for those of you, by the way, there, I know there are a few of you here who were here at the beginning, i.e. When, when I was seven and showed up for my first day here at the foundation. Um, exactly. Well, you were 12, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so here's just a few things we thought we would highlight thinking back over the last nearly 25 years. Uh, one being that, um, you know, obviously, as you know, for endowment funds and long-term capital, the, the primary charge of any foundation is to preserve its purchasing power. Um, and that's you know, after grants, expenses, and inflation, can you earn a return that exceeds that? And we actually now, since 1994, actually have a record of basically adding, not just achieving that goal, but accentuating that goal, adding to it by 15 percentage points. And you know, with a large asset base like exists today at the foundation, I'll show you that in a minute, um, that's a lot of money in this community, and so you know, I, again, I'm not saying we don't deserve credit for that, but I think we've had a great partnership with a series of finance committees over the years that have generated you know, clearly a successful outcome. Um, in this world of 2019, and this comes and goes, of course, but today feels like a very strong version of why don't we just put it all in the S&P 500 index and, and save a lot of money on fees, uh, which is Saving money on fees is good, by the way. Uh, but putting money in something like an index, but in this foundation actually has outperformed indexes over time. And I think that's a significant uh, achievement as well for the Finance Committee, and, and we've been glad to have a part of that. And the last thing, which I'm going to show you a real example at the end, because part of the why not just put it all in the S&P 500 uh, question has a real answer for a grant-making organization, which I'm going to give you, I hope, is a really useful illustration of that in a minute. So with that said, um, when we showed up uh, way back when, uh, the foundation, that was actually about, I believe the number was 10 or $12 million, I think that might have been in the portfolio back then. And, and you can see this just unbelievable growth of the assets. We're getting close to a quarter of a billion dollars in this foundation. That's, by the way, that's not all investment return. That's the wonderful work of the team here and the, de and the development and a whole bunch of other great things that have happened. But at the same time, the foundation, as you all know, has supported this community in a major way over this period of time as well. And so this growth is just stunning. In fact, um, stunning is the only word I think that can be used to describe it. And it's been a gigantic success uh, for the foundation, period. Um, and it's also, by the way, given us, and I'll get this at the end, it's given us a lot more tools we can use to, we hope, perpetuate the results that, that have been earned historically and actually increase the likelihood of them continuing. But here's just a few key milestones. Um, Believe it or not, when we showed up, there was no total return spending policy here. Income policies were still in vogue. And I don't know if it, now with interest rates as low as they are, can you imagine trying to pursue an income policy today? That, that would be a, a total disaster. So uh, you guys were way ahead of your time back then in terms of getting away from that. And you know, total return, which is what everyone uses today, of course, is important. Back in the 90s, though, not quite as common as today. Second thing, um, we did add the evil term hedge funds to the portfolio in 2000s. That's proven to be a big part of the balancing act, which I'll show you a little bit later. So it's not been an unsuccessful part of the portfolio. Uh, 2008, I think, might have been one of the great periods of stress and opportunity in, in this portfolio's history. And you can see, uh, we'll talk about that a little later, but uh, the foundation absolutely capitalized on that. Uh, and my favorite example is uh, made a commitment. The greatest thing in investing, in my opinion, you can say, is that you, when you do something and later on you look back at the results, your reaction is, God, I wish I had done more mm -hmm. or we had done more. And this was that happened with this situation. In 2008, the foundation committed a million dollars, which was you know, a lot of money back then, is a lot of money today as well, to a fund that bought up private equity interests from all the panic sellers in the college, university, private world in general, and you know, had made a fortune on that kind of thing. So the foundation didn't panic and recede. Instead, it actually leaned in and took advantage of, you know, unfortunately, a very difficult situation. And then last but not least, um, fees do matter. Uh, and we have increasingly moved away from fund of funds type structures to direct structures where we're actually not paying a middleman to pick managers in any part of this portfolio anymore. And I think that's also very, very, very valuable for us. 
So um, let's go back to the financial crisis just for a minute, because this is really one of the signature events in the foundation's history. And it's one of the, if you think about other nonprofits or other investors you're familiar with, it's one of the great tests of any investor's long-term thinking that have pro hopefully we'll ever have in our lifetimes, I would hope. So from 2007 to 2009, the portfolio did lose 35.4% of its return. Uh, we're doing an event uh, after this with donors. We're talking about the philosophy. And the philosophy is the philosophy that many of you remember in the old days and to the day, which is we don't make forecasts about short-term events. We have no idea what will happen next in markets. That's not part of the strategy. And that's great when markets are going up and you're not going to cash, of course. It's not so great when markets are dropping and you're not going to cash. And so we had a 35.4% loss in this portfolio. It was better than the benchmark, but who cares? Uh, it was a 35% loss, basically. That was hardly something to be uh, celebrated, celebrated. But again, the idea of discipline, rebalancing, leaning into opportunities that were created by panic, um, which we're actually seeing today in different ways, um, the loss was all gone by the end of 2010, which was, you know, I will say one of the more surprising things I can remember in my career because we were sure it would take three to five years minimum to dig out of that hole. And that, that, that's one of the reasons you kind of get burned into your brain not to try to guess what's going to happen because things can be very surprising. And then last but not least, I think this was sort of interesting. So from that bottom, um, I'm sure you all heard and still hear to this day that we're in a low return climate. Um, and that was even back then. I remember vividly, not in this foundation, but people talking about, oh, after this crisis, there's no way people are going to make money for a very, very long time. And you know, we didn't know that that was true or not true, but we don't believe in that kind of forecast. And what you can see, though, is the portfolio since the bottom, so that's at the end, after the 35% loss, has actually earned about 156% since then, which is not anyone's definition of a low return climate, for sure. And that was the opportunity cost to getting defensive at a time where you should have actually probably been aggressive, not defensive. And last but not least, we added one more little thing. If you start at that peak before the drop, you still made 65% cumulatively, which again, not a great return for what was eventually a 12-year period, but hardly a disaster in terms of the long-term history of this foundation. So quickly, uh, we've tried to change alongside, so I showed you the asset growth and the success of the foundation. The colonial that was hired here many years ago is, was a little different. A lot of us are the same people, actually almost most of the senior people at Colonial are, are still there. And I'm chief investment officer today, which is just a product of sticking around the longest. You just get handed that job, basically. I have no qualifications whatsoever. Um, so I also, I had to say, we, I did this from memory. So 1990, that's why I put the big asterisk. I was worried about accuracy. And I'm not going to guarantee accuracy, but it's close. So we had 13 clients back when you hired us. And you know, actually, if I think back on my career, just from a personal note, um, this foundation took a big, I think, a big chance on us at the time. And you know, so I'm really grateful because it was something that kick-started you know, my career in a lot of ways, personally and, and colonial as well, into becoming what we'd like to think we are today. Um, so we've grown a lot in terms of number of clients, client assets, staff size, <clears throat> but what we haven't changed is we're still 100% employee owned and will remain that way, by the way. There are no exceptions to that uh, going forward. Uh, I think that this is not a business, believe it or not, that scales very well. Uh, we have, in, you'll see in the portfolio in a minute, we have some very small managers that are used and we can't just keep adding more and more and more clients and we certainly can't sell the firm because we do that, someone's only gonna buy it to try to make it bigger. And, and that's, that's a, we think, a violation of the trust we have with all of you, especially, especially this foundation who 25 years ago took a chance on us. We don't really wanna stick our finger in the current group's eye essentially by saying, well, we don't care about that anymore. And last but not least, we remain focused on endowments and foundations. There are 93% of our client base. That was probably about the same number way back when, give or, give or take. So a uh, couple things. This is the one I really want to spend a minute on, if you don't mind. This is back to that question of balance, which is why not put the money in the S&P 500 and simplify life? Because we have, we, if you look through the portfolio, it's not simple. The current finance committee will certainly agree with the statement that there's a lot of moving parts. And, and why do we do this is a big question. So what we did is we went back 20 years because we had good returns. There's also the portfolio was above a reasonable level to look at that number. Uh, and we went back 20 years and we said, well, let's look at a simulation where we take a hypothetical million dollar donor fund shows up here at the end of 1999 or in the middle of 1999, I should say, and it gets invested one of three ways. The blue bars invested in the pool. So it's simulation because that fund didn't actually exist. We made one up. It's not simulated returns. The returns are the returns of the portfolio. So that's the blue bars of the portfolio's returns. I'll show you what these mean in a second. The orange bars are ACWI, which is basically all global stocks, emerging markets, U.S. markets, developed Europe, Japan, et cetera. And the beige, the gray bars are the S&P 500. 
just US stocks. So what we did is we took this million dollars and we invested in each of those three portfolios. We didn't add a nickel to it, so that donor just left the money here at some point in time and never added to it. We did take out 5% of a 20 quarter rolling average over time, just to keep it simple, uh, and we saw what happened. So at the end of 2000, middle of 2019, I should say just a month ago or so, we looked at the ending fund balance. Now, Millie, it hasn't grown. It stayed at a million dollars in the, um, in the million dollars is still a million dollars, so it didn't keep up with its purchasing power, to be clear. However, um, it did do quite a bit better in terms of the ending fund balance than either of the all stock portfolios did. So that's an important part of the equation. The second part of the equation, which is also important, is how much went out in grants over that period of time. And you can see the blue bars, i.e. the portfolio, distributed a lot more money to the community and ended up with a higher ending fund balance. And then we made up a, a number at the right called total charitable capital. All we did is we said, well, what's the ending fund balance plus the grants? That, it doesn't have a meaning. We just made it up, essentially. But that's what it is, essentially. So the point, though, is that you know, this portfolio has achieved the things you want to achieve, which is actually done, has a end, higher ending fund balance and distributed more money. And you might say, well, how could that be? Because I will tell you, the portfolio did not do as well as the S&P 500 over this period of time. It did about a percent, I believe, or so lower per year. And the reason this outcome is possible is because volatility matters in investing. And if, go back to 2008 for a second, the S&P 500 was down about 50% over that period of time. It didn't catch up as quickly. But the other issue is that when something's down 50% and you're spending on a 20 quarter average, you're spending a big percentage of the current value. So all that volatility does permanent damage to a charitable fund at this foundation because we're taking money out all the time. And it's taking money out is the, mi is the missing element when you think about investment return. Now, there's two ways you can go. You can become too aggressive with a portfolio and then the volatility does permanent damage. Or you can become too conservative with a portfolio and then you, you give up too much return. And if that had been the case, those blue bars wouldn't be above the gray or the orange. Does that all make sense? I'm test running this on you guys for later. <laughs> Okay, so this is, I think, another example of balance and complexity actually being successful. So we think the portfolio's future is really quite bright for a couple reasons. Uh, one is that you know, we've lowered some fees. Um, and the committee, by the way, today, which I'm going to brag about in a minute, you can see right there, actually, I'm going to brag about them right now. Um, the finance committee today, I'm not, not going to suggest it's better than in the past. It's just great, just like it's been in the past. But the finance committee today has become increasingly um, willing, I think, to do some things that are, are different, which are not options that existed before, to be clear, and they're different because the foundation portfolio is bigger, just to be clear, that's the big difference. And the things that are different are, one, a lot of niche strategies we're using in the portfolio today, and I'll show you the group later some of the returns that have been earned from some of those niche strategies have been quite large. Uh, younger managers, um, managers that are launching new launches, which essentially have little to no track record, but lots of reasons because of their pedigree and their experience and their talent to understand that they'll do well. And in return for giving money people early in their career, you usually get fee discounts and all kinds of things for the life of your investment. Two, you've got better alignment of interest because they're not already rich and, and kind of happy. They're trying to earn something. They've got a lot of drive and determination, some of these younger managers. And as we pointed out at the end, um, there's been a big push in this portfolio, and I just alluded to some of this, to get real diversification. So real diversification is stocks and bonds and all these other things, but real diversification is also age. Um, younger PMs see the world differently than those of us who are a little more mature. Location in the world changes your perspective. So this foundation portfolio now is managed in literally almost every continent, not quite every continent in the world, but increasingly every continent in the world. And three, uh, gender and race, um, which is another big part of the diversification of this portfolio as well. Again, different people, different life experiences, different perspective. And that's what investing is all about, is risk takers who do not all see the world the same way, because otherwise you don't have diversification. And so these are major, major parts of the whole strategy. And have so far, oops, so far been quite successful, I think. So I was going to um, stop there and see if you had anything, questions? But I've left you all without questions. Yeah. So <coughs> in the last couple of years, small cap stocks have not performed as well as other stocks. What is going on? Is there something fundamentally changed? Um, you know, I think about, you, you read in the Wall Street Journal about companies that, that they almost skip the small cap, the small cap space. They, they like just jump, um, you know, through uh, equity investments and so forth. So what, what's going on with small cap? It's actually, if I can take that question into a bigger issue that we think exists right now, and there's a term that uh, a manager we don't use in this portfolio use, which I think is just great. 
that we are actually, now we've had a, a very big bull market for the S&P 500 for the last 10 years, and everyone sees that, and there's records and all these good things. But the reality is that the vast majority of the world's markets have not really participated in this, and that includes to some degree, to your question, smaller companies in the U.S. as well, to some degree. Um, and the term that this manager used, which we just think is brilliant, is fear bubble. Um, there's a fear bubble in the world right now. And so, and by the way, the way you can just kind of drive, put an exclamation point through that concept is to point out that there are over $13 trillion right now of bonds in the world that are trading with negative interest rates. And for those of you who say, what the heck is a negative interest rate? It's, it's, as, it's as ludicrous as it sounds, which is it's essentially giving someone money uh, and paying them to use your money. Uh, it literally, if, if that sounds crazy, it is. But it's a perfect, perfect illustration of what a fear bubble is. And so let's extens, extend that concept now. So the fear bubble, which has driven interest rates to these levels and negative in most of the world, has also driven people away from anything that is perceived to be risky. Small companies, emerging markets, Japan, Europe, the UK. You can go on a whole laundry list of things that scare people. Cyclical companies, banks. I mean, just little, the list goes on and on and on. They love utilities. They love REITs. They love the S&P 500 index because it's got plenty of the stuff that has been working. They love software companies. There's a whole bunch of things that people love. Uh, and that's because it's perceived as safe, number one. And also, human beings never change, which is that we're all products of wanting to own the things that are working and not own the things that are not working. And if you really want to, by the way, boil down our philosophy here to a simple, single, thi single thing, it's just that is to lean away from the stuff that's working to the stuff that's not working because the markets are giving you opportunities. That's not the way anyone feels about it. And the bugaboo that we have to deal with is that while you're leaning away from the things that are working, the thing that you can't do, at least we can't do, is know when you'll be rewarded for that behavior. And so that's the balancing act, which is, oh, how dumb are we willing to look in the short term so that we can look really smart in the long term? It's not a simple question, by the way, especially because you know, we have constituents in this of this foundation who are using these funds for important things and they have perceptions of how you're doing and, and the foundation has a brand that needs to be protected as well. So it's a very complicated question. But back to your question, it's all in the fear bubble uh, that a lot of small companies are, are the way they are. Um, bubbles always pop. Uh, when they pop is anyone's guess, of course, but that's why we love to use our very long time horizon to try to push away the question of when and say, let's just own really attractive investments uh, and they become attractive because other people don't like them. So of the 13 original clients that you had, how many are still with you? Well, that's a great question. Um, I'm going to have to give you another one of my famous estimates. Um, I believe we have eight or nine of them are still clients. Um, and in fact, the earliest colonial clients hired us in 1980 and are still with us. I, I don't think they'd mind me disclosing it's actually the Salvation Army. Um, there's been a clone. That was our, our client client at the time, and there's still a important client of Colonials, of course. But yeah, they were here in 1980. And uh, I, can think of, I can think of at least seven or eight that are still with us that were here before the foundation, yeah. Like, hey, uh, spending rate. Yeah. So what's your sense of what uh, other foundations are doing and endowments are doing is 5%? Uh, still the norm. I know that there's some that faded into the fours, uh, more aggressive. What's, what's your perception and sense of where it should be? Yeah, so um, the, the statistical answer, the factual answer is yeah, people are fading into the fours, by the way. So we see a more and more in the four and a quarter, four and a half range among community foundations. Obviously, private foundations can't. Um, and um, we've got mixed feelings on this subject. So back, what, we were horrified back in 2009 when we saw people, not our clients too much because we tried to argue against it, cutting spending. One, not, and I'm not even doing mission when I say that comment. When markets are plunging, expected returns are going up. There's no reason to cut spending. It's when markets are soaring that expected returns are dropping, and you could argue that you should cut spending. So that, that people do it in a more of an emotional, reactional way, typically. Um, today's a little bit weird because the, the people who are shaving them back a little bit are doing so, one, because interest rates are as low as they are, and that does take away a return engine for us, for sure. Um, Two, they react to the S&P being at record levels, which is a fair point as well. Um, we, though, because of our fear bubble theories, um, see like we're like we think this is an exciting time to be an investor. We actually think that compounding at eight percent returns with a really well built and admittedly unpopular portfolio, so we have to hopefully hold our hold ourselves together while until it works, um, can pay off at five. So we're actually not worried about the five so much, but people are. 
Uh, maybe it's also another expression of the fear bubble uh, as well, but nevertheless, so we are seeing a trend down. I'm not sure it's correct to feel that way and to, to do that, but that's what people are doing. Michael? Yes, sir. Uh, of the quarter of a billion between what you have done and net new, what is, what is net new money to this fund versus return? Maybe somebody here could, from the foundation could answer. I can guess, but does anyone want to make a real answer? Kim, you want my guess? Oh. I would guess that at least a hundred million of it is new money, uh, at least. Does that seem reasonable, Kim? What do you think? Yeah. So let's say half and half. I mean, again, that's, that's a complete guess, forgive me for not knowing. I could look at, we could figure it out if, if, if you want a real answer, Paul, and we can get you one for sure. So Mike, what are you doing now different than before in terms of, you know, you, you that yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think there's really one or two things that are really different today from, and we've learned over the years about. One is, um, looking back, um, the portfolio had a lot of very diversified active managers and some index funds as well. And so one of the changes is to sort of move away from the diversified active manager and use active managers who are really going to have returns that are much different from the indexes because they're in a niche like healthcare or they're buying only 10 stocks or eight stocks. Like we have a manager at Darlington in the portfolio now. So this concept of having kind of more of a barbell approach where we keep the index funds because they're great and we add on what we think are very high octane active managers with all the good and bad that comes with that, by the way, that's one really Big, big change, and, and that's where, the, again, the bigger portfolio size allows you to do that. You know, our best investment, which I'll get a chance to brag about to the bigger group later, is, is a firm called First Light, which literally owns 20 microcap healthcare stocks, um, and they've outperformed their index. They've been here with us for only 18 months, but they've outperformed their index by 56 percentage points. I mean, so the index is up two, they're up 58. I mean, and because they had one or two stocks that we're just rocket ships, and, and that's concentrated investing when it works. It doesn't always work that well. Just to be clear, I don't want to suggest that, we're, that that's a skill we have to pick all those. Uh, you were there improving them, actually, Grace. Um, but the, um, so that's one change, is that shift towards higher octane managers, which is a big issue with us. And the second is this last piece. Um, this age, location, gender, and race piece is very different today. Um, so let me give you the statistics. Um, if you look at stats that have been done about the asset management industry, about 98.5% of assets are managed by firms that are owned by white men. Um, and 1.5% are owned by women or people of color. So the foundation portfolio has 10% in the hands of women and people of color currently, which is up fourfold over the last few years. And let me just be very clear here. Uh, we're not doing, uh, while I'm a big fan of social justice, I'm sure you all are, we're not doing social justice. We're doing great investing. Uh, and what we love is that because you have gigantic segment of the, well, not gigantic, a segment of the asset management population that's completely overlooked for a lot of different reasons, they're sitting there and we can find them, get access to them. Because with the 38 billion, we spend a lot of our time begging people to let us into their funds. I mean, that, that's literally what we spend. I, I can't even tell you how many times we do that. Um, and like we have Darlington in this portfolio right now, which is actually not a diverse manager, but Darlington was closed to us for seven years and we got lucky because a big investor decided to leave. And so that was our chance to get in, but that was five years of begging that essentially led to that. And so when you get into firms with you know, different gender, different race, you don't do as much begging because uh, these firms are having a hard time raising capital. And we're finding managers, and we wrote a piece, if you go to our website, or I'm sure the foundation can give it to you, we wrote a piece about the diverse manager work at Colonial. And by the way, the performance of the diverse managers at Colonial, which have been crushing it. Um, and so that's about 23 firms right now. And Colonial has about $3 billion now in the hands of diverse managers, which sadly makes us a leader in the field, believe it or not, which is ridiculous because that's not that much of our capital. But my point is, that's the other change, which is age, location, and uh, gender and race. Um, and so what's happened to us, so this is the beauty of us getting a little bigger. So our research effort is global right now. Um, and just to use me as an example, because I, I travel with the team in a lot of different ways. So I've been to Asia twice this year, Europe three times, Africa twice, uh, once, excuse me, going back again. And we're finding managers in all these parts of the world that are first class managers in every way. And that's also enhancing the portfolio. We've been hearing that, uh, that over the next, five to ten years that we should expect returns at five, six percent. Um, what's your position? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So that depends on where you look. Um, so um, I think perhaps the most popular investment that I hear about, and I want to tell you a funny story, but don't let me forget, um, is the S&P 500 today. So we're big believers in something called a Schiller ratio. I'm not sure if any, everyone knows what a Schiller ratio does. Is it basically, it's Bob Schiller, he's a professor at Yale, and he came up with this idea for how do you value markets. And, and his basic idea is you take, it sounds a little, little simplistic, but it, it works. He takes 10 years of historic earnings, adjusts them from inflation, and comes up with an average. And the point of that is to get rid of the cyclicality of economic conditions and earnings, essentially, through time. And the Schiller ratio, this is going to your question, on the S&P 500 is about 30 times. The historic average is 16 times. So the S&P, it's been a wonderful ride, but it's trading at twice its historical average right now. By the way, just to give you the contrast, the rest of the world are trading at subpar Schiller ratios in the low to mid-teens, basically, emerging markets and, and Europe, let's say, and Japan. So it's a big chasm which has emerged. So now, I'm really going to get to your point now. So what you can do is historically go back, because the Schiller data exists to the 20s, and you can do a regression. And you can find there's a very high correlation, inverse, between the height of the Schiller ratio or the depths and the next 10 years returns. If you do the correlation on a 30 times Schiller, it's uh, expected return for the S&P is about 4 to 5 percent a year. Nominal. That's not after inflation. So that's why I believe in that number very wholeheartedly. <coughs> now, with that said, if you own cyclical companies in the U.S. or you own almost anything else in the world, now you're back to an 8 or 9 percent expected return. So we don't actually believe the 4 or 5 percent is the answer. But it's the answer for an S&P 500 investor, for sure. It's the most likely outcome. And if people are good with that, then that's great. I don't think that's an acceptable level of return for the risk of owning something in the stock market. But you, people can have their own opinions on that subject. The funny thing I want to point out, though, is I just got a notice yesterday, maybe some of you did as well, that Vanguard, who is our favorites, by the way, we love Vanguard. Colonial client, the foundation has money of Vanguard. Colonial clients use Vanguard incessantly. Um, Vanguard put out a piece yesterday, or a note, saying that they were going to change the prospectuses of their growth funds, the mega cap growth, the mid cap growth, the large cap growth fund, their index funds, essentially, to take away the requirement that they be considered diversified portfolios in the eyes of the SEC. Um, and the reason for that, so why would you do that? And the answer is because the indexes are so dominated by just a few names, say, on the growth side of the equation, which is where a lot of this excessive valuation is, that the in, you can't run an index fund and meet the securities laws around what is a diversified portfolio anymore. If, think about that. It's, it's a really stunning statement. And if you're ever looking for a sign that, wow, maybe we're at the top of some kind of cycle here, that's one of those signs, right? That it's just like, wow, an index fund is not technically diversified anymore. Now, it's got to be a growth index, not the S&P 500, just to be, to be clear. So I agree with you in the four to five in my own meandering way. Thank you all. Thanks,